Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we're good. Right. Excellent. So, welcome to planet Earth, or what I prefer to call planet ocean, because there is an awful lot of sea out there, and actually much more than land. And as far as we know, this little rock is unique in the universe for its capacity to support life. And life is everywhere. There are hugely diverse ecosystems on land, but also in the oceans. And coral reefs in the tropical oceans are some of the most diverse ecosystems on the planet. What we have here on the left is the Great Barrier Reef, probably one of the most famous coral reefs in the world. And to really understand the importance and beauty of coral reefs, what's more important than looking at these aerial photos is what's going on in the water. How many people here have been to coral reefs? A few of us, but not everybody. So this is the kind of thing that you will hopefully see when you go to these beautiful ecosystems. They're hugely complex and host a huge diversity of life. The Great Barrier Reef is 35,000 square kilometers. It's so big that you can see it from space. And these ecosystems can provide us with a huge amount of what we call ecosystem services. So you guys have probably been to the coral reefs for, as, as tourists, so you're going there on holiday, and that brings money into those countries. And we also get other resources, such as building materials, which is still a vital component of the things we get from coral reefs today. And actually, coral reefs are hugely important to and directly benefit up to 500 million people around the world. And that's an awful lot. And when we think that 30 million people around the world depend on their livelihoods for coral reefs, these things are absolutely vital for our global ecosystem and our global health. So coral reefs are economically, ecologically, and culturally important to us. And actually, studies have been done to, um, to understand the importance of coral reefs. And actually, us just knowing that they exist is shown to, be, to make us feel happier about everything and about life. And I'm up here talking about coral reefs in a nice tropical dress, um, but you may think, why the hell am I talking about coral reefs when I'm in a perhaps not so sunny climate? But actually, when we think of the UK overseas territories, the UK has the fifth largest area of coral reef in the world. So even for this country, the coral reefs are really important to us. But there is always a but. Coral reefs around the world are under threat, and most of the time when you hear about coral reefs in the media these days, it's always a sad story about how threatened they are. And one of the biggest threats to coral reefs is climate change. Now, the graph on the left here is the amount of carbon dioxide that's been measured in the atmosphere at a location in Hawaii since the late 1950s. And I think all of you will agree with me that that line on that graph is going up. So there is more CO2 in the atmosphere now than there has been for the past 800,000 years or so. And the rate of that change is incredibly quick and much quicker than we have seen for millions of years. Now, where is that CO2 coming from? A lot of it is down to us. We are the reason that that graph is going up. Burning of fossil fuels is a huge component of that. So driving cars, flying planes, industries, they all produce CO2. And when we look at other greenhouse gases, such as methane, all of those gases are going up. Another major source that often gets overlooked is the production of concrete. And actually, if you think about how much concrete there is maybe in Belfast, or how much concrete there is in the UK, how much concrete there is in the world, that's an awful lot of CO2 being produced. And then looking at a natural, um, or perhaps unnatural, uh, source of CO2, deforestation is kind of the reverse of that. By chopping down our forests, we're stopping CO2 being absorbed 
by those forests. And if we burn those logs, then we release all the carbon that's locked up in those trees uh, back into the atmosphere again. So that's all very well and good, but what does that mean? If we're increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, actually that then increases our Earth's ability to trap the sun's energy, which is what it naturally does and is the reason that this planet is able to support life. But if it's trapping it much, uh, much quicker, then the the temperature of um, the sorry the temperature of the uh, of the Earth rapidly increases, and we can see that from temperature records that we have around the world. So what I'm going to show you now is the average annual global temperature of the world since 1850. And these are going to, it's colour coded, so the coldest um, year that we had is in the darkest blue. The warmest year that we've had is in the darkest red. And what you can see is that there is variability here. Um, in 1877, we had a strong El Nino, which you may have heard about, it's a climate phenomenon, and that increased the temperature. And then we have some cooling around um, the late, 18, um, late 1800s, and then things start to change. And what's most striking is how much red there is on the right-hand side of this slide. And that's really exemplifying how quickly the Earth's temperature has been increasing as a global average um, since the kind of 1980s. Now, one thing I want you to take away from this is that this is not a nice gradient of temperature. There is variability in there, and that's just because of the natural cycles within the Earth. But what, we, what is most striking is this red chunk at the end. And that's what's driving these um, worries about the survival of coral reefs. And specifically, what we have are some really dark red stripes on specific years. And those years were associated with what we call mass bleaching events of coral reefs. Now the problem is, when we have a really high temperature in the water, the corals don't like it very much. Just like we, get, we struggle with heat waves, the corals struggle with heat waves as well. Corals have an algae in their tissues and that's why they love the light. Those algae provide the coral with energy. But if the coral gets too hot, it gets stressed out and those algae leave. And when that happens, we have what we call coral bleaching. And that creates a very different vibe within coral reefs. And the algae provide corals with almost all of the energy that they need to survive. So if those algae have gone and the, and they don't, the corals don't get the algae back quick enough, the corals will sadly die. At this point, when they've just bleached, the corals are not yet dead. So there is still hope for recovery if temperatures come back down to a okay level and allow those algae to return to the corals. But, another but, uh, when you look closely at this image of a bleached reef, Actually, not all of the corals in that reef have bleached. And these are the corals that I conduct my research on. Because these ones are the resilient corals. For whatever reason, these corals have, are tolerant to that big increase in temperature. Understanding how those corals have become so resilient, whether that's physiological or structural, really gives us the hope that we need for whether corals will be able to survive in the future. Because it's expected that temperatures are going to keep going up if we don't make some radical changes. So what I'm going to do now is talk about three different examples of my research that we, um, where we're trying to understand how these corals are resilient. The first one are the massives. Now, some of you may know these corals as the brain corals. These are the big globe-type globe stru uh, coral structures that are so reminiscent in a coral reef community. 
Now, almost always, these massive corals are recorded as being very resilient to bleaching. So they remain this pigmented color when other corals around them have bleached. But understanding why they have bleached is a little bit tricky. Uh, they are one big massive lump of rock. And so I say massive, it gets a bit confusing because they can be really big, so they can be very massive, but also their shape is a massive coral. So massive, massive ones. And they can be as big as cars, if not even bigger. And what's so useful about these things is that they're very long-lived, and just like trees, they can lay down growth rings within their carbonate, calcium carbonate skeleton. But how on earth, if this is a big lump of calcium carbonate, a big lump of limestone, how on earth do we get access to those coral, uh, to those coral reef, um, to those coral growth bands to understand how this coral has reacted to the different temperatures that, it's, it's, it, that it has experienced over the past 50 or 100 years. The answer to that is the use of power tools. And this is when, actually, marine biology gets a little bit more physical and we bring out the pneumatic drills. And what we do is we core these corals. So just like you might do with some sediment, we take a core out of one of the corals. Once we've gone as deep as we can, we then fish that core out and we end up with a nice tube of the skeleton of that coral. Now that coral um, core, as you can see, is just a lump of limestone. And so looking at it just like that, there's not really a huge amount that we can do with it. But what we can do is x-ray that core. And when we do that, we can then start to see the growth bands within that coral core. And each of those growth bands relates to one year of growth. Now we know that when corals bleach, they quite understandably slow down in their growth. They're receiving much, much less energy because they don't have those algae. And we understand the relationship between coral bleaching and the subsequent years of growth. So what we can do is identify years when that coral did bleach from this record of growth over time. And that means we can reconstruct bleaching from the present day back into the past. And if we do that, we can try and understand how corals have responded to changes in temperature uh, over the past few hundred years, if we can get um, records of that. And that's exactly what some colleagues of mine did. And they reconstructed bleaching in the Great Barrier Reef from the past 400 years or so. Now, the most important thing to take away from this graph is that there is something to look at. So there are bars on these graphs. And that means these corals have bleached in the past, even way back in 1650. And way back then, there wasn't so much carbon dioxide around. We weren't producing as much. Um, we didn't have as much industry. <coughs> so this shows that actually coral bleaching isn't a new phenomenon. So maybe that gives us hope that these corals actually can resist bleaching events and can tolerate bleaching events and continue to grow um, and continue to thrive despite having bleached in the past. But the one thing that we do need to take away from this is that when we analyse the trends in that data, since about the 1800s, which nicely coincides with when we started uh, industrialization and started ramping up that carbon dioxide level, the rate of bleaching and the amount of bleaching has considerably increased. What we now need to understand is, given the continued increase in temperatures, can corals continue to be okay with bleaching 
on a regular basis? Can they still be resilient with that continued um, pressure on, on, uh, on bleaching strategies? So our second, uh, second example is for coralliths. And these are a quite odd type of coral. They are completely free living. And unlike most corals, which are stuck to the bedrock, these are little balls of coral that roll around and get moved around by water currents. Now, what's incredible about these guys is that they do not live in where you would think corals should. Uh, I apologize for the uh, jiggling about. I'm not a very good um, underwater video videographer. But what you will see is that there is a lot of nothing here, but every so often you will see a little orange blob, and that is a coralith. And this is the type of environment that these guys live in. This is very cloudy, it's very shallow, so it's very warm, um, and it's just not the sort of environment you would think corals would be. Yet these guys are thriving. And actually what we find is that these corals are, these coralliths are physiologically different, even though they're the same species as these ones that are attached to the substrate. So these corals are more resilient to bleaching than if they were stuck to the bedrock, but these corals can grow um, to a suitable size to enable other corals to then start growing on them. So these coralliths can actually form the basis of a new coral reef. And that means that that coral reef has a base of a really resilient coral. So we think that these coralith um, originating coral reefs are produced reefs that are more resilient to the bleaching pressures that these reefs are facing. And that helps support other corals, which are much more resilient, naturally resilient to bleaching. And that brings me on to my third example, which is the blue coral. Now, this coral is absolutely beautiful. As you can see on the bottom left here, it, it is unique in the coral world by having a blue skeleton. And what we're trying to do is understand whether that blue skeleton gives the corals an effect effectively a type of sunscreen and helps protect them against environmental change. And what we found is that actually that blue colour helps absorb light. So instead of light bouncing around that white skeleton, it absorbs it just like our sunscreen does and then stops that light going around all the cells and creating oxidative damage just like um, happens to us when we get sunburn. And what we found is that this skeleton of this coral is really interesting. Uh, it has an enrichment of iron in, on the edges of that skeleton. So here we have kind of fingers of skeleton sticking up, and there is a very fine enrichment of iron on the edges. And we think that this provides protection against environmental conditions such as um, low pH which otherwise creates a real problem if you've got a calcium carbonate skeleton. So what does this mean for future of coral reefs? It means that there is actually some hope. We can harness these different strategies by creating, um, we can grow up baby corals that are made of, uh, originating from these hardy hardy types of corals, or we can promote their natural growth um, in, the, in the environment. But actually, all those, um, all those strategies where we're trying to intervene are incredibly labor intensive. And so seeding a reef with baby corals and manually going out and gluing corals onto the reef is a nice thing to do, perhaps if you're an ecotourist, but Trying to do that over 35,000 square kilometers of the Great Barrier Reef is perhaps completely unfeasible. What I hope I've shown you is that actually corals have their own strategies 
for coping with environmental change. They've been around for a very, very long time, and they're quite good at being coral, much better than we are at being coral. So maybe, actually, what we need to be thinking about is stopping the trigger of these coral bleaching events, which comes down to climate change. And so this is my call to action for you guys. You guys are obviously here because you care about the environment. So do something about that. Um, our leaders, our MPs, are quite busy at the moment. Um, but climate change is not going away. And on top of everything else, the environment is always going to be there. So remind them that this is still a really important point. Climate change is an international problem, but it also could, it, as a personal level, it's also something that we can do something about. So bearing in mind your carbon footprint is a really important thing to do. And actually, this is mine from 2017, which you can see is uh, the first few um, categories, which are things like housing, um, food, I do pretty well compared to the UK average. But then we have this purple bar, uh, which sends me way over the UK average. And those are my flights from 2017. And most of those were to do with work, which is somewhat ironic given that I am working within climate change. And that's something that is a problem for most climate scientists out there. Um, and something that we have discussions about and we're trying to um, come to solutions to. The other thing is to think about all those other pressures that coral reefs are facing, and as, as are all of our other ecosystems around the world. Plastic is, gets a lot of press these days. Single use was word of the year for this year. Um, and it is really important to think about single-use plastics and trying to find ways within our lifestyle to minimise those. Do be careful, though, because something like getting rid of plastic straws does not solve the plastic problem. So do be aware, and as an informed audience, do point out that just because you're not using plastic straws anymore, that doesn't mean that you've ticked your box, you've done your eco thing. It's about a lifestyle change and thinking about how we can manage that. So that is all I have for you this evening. Thank you very much for listening. And I will leave you with a lovely little anemone fish um, going about their business. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heidi. Um, hope everybody starts thinking about their questions now because I'm going to pounce on random members of the audience. Um, that was fantastic. That was very interesting. I like that there was a call to action there, but as you say, the leaders are very busy. Our leaders are not, so <laughs> write, <laughs> write to them all you like. There's plenty of time to read those. Um, have you always kind of had a passion for global warming, or has that kind of been ignited from your studies? I think as a kid, I did not know about climate change. It was not, at least as far as I can tell, it was not in the media as much and not as obvious. So as a kid, I just liked going to rock pools and seeing all the cool stuff, but I didn't think, hmm, I wonder how climate change is happening, is changing that. Um, could we take a question from our audience? Could people put up their hand if they have a question? Yes, please go ahead. Can we get the room mic? Mike? Um, I was uh, curious about the graphs that you had earlier, um, you know, from the coral cores going back to uh, 1600. Yeah. There was a really, you know, during the 1500s and 1600s, it seemed like corals were bleaching regularly. And, um, and, and extensively, like more so than today even. What, what was that caused by? Was that like the other way around, like it was too cold or something? Or? It could well have been. Uh, so coral bleaching is the one thing these days that gets marked as being the trigger for coral bleaching is warming, but actually loads of things cause coral bleaching. Being too cold is one of them. 
things like um, low salinity, so if there's a big storm that, and lots of land runoff um, of fresh water, that will trigger coral bleaching. But also if the coral gets sick from a virus or bacteria, um, if the algae gets sick, the coral doesn't want that algae anymore, and so it might expel it and in a bid to get better algae. So there are a lot of different triggers for bleaching, um, and it's, it's remembering that and actually do those other triggers actually help increase that resilience that corals have to these environmental changes. They might almost have built-in things that are helping them as well. Exactly. Corals and that, relation, that symbiotic relationship has been around for a long, long time. So they've, they've been through a lot and they're still here. It's kind of like marriage counselling. <laughs> Uh, for algae. Not something I thought we'd hear tonight. There we go. To fair. <laughs> uh, we have a question here at the front. Yes? If you bring the microphone down. Yep. Hi. Um, your graph which showed the, uh, the warming from 1750 onwards, um, that graph only showed uh, a temperature change of one degree over that entire period, uh, roughly one degree over that entire period. And since 1990, I believe there's been very, very little change in the temperature. Why is it that the later part of your graph actually showed more bleaching of the actual corals? So you're absolutely right. The um, absolute change that we have seen over the past, since 1850, um, as a global average is, compared to our temperate climate, doesn't seem like a lot. The problem, uh, problem comes because this is, one, a global average, so it doesn't tell you about the changes that happened on the Great Barrier Reef, for example. Um, but it's also about what those, um, what those ecosystems are used to. So if the corals and their ecosystems are used to a very stable environment, then a slight change in um, temperature is enough to cause those triggers. What's most striking about the most recent coral bleaching events is actually the peaks in temperature, which didn't last very long, a few weeks, but that's enough to trigger um, coral bleaching. Those were four, five, six degree increases in temperature, very, very quick, um, when those are the triggers for coral bleaching this steady trend and increase in temperature in itself doesn't necessarily trigger those bleaching events. Yeah, but would it be considered that the, uh, there's an inertia? There's an inertia between the time the air temperature increases and that of the sea increases. Well, it's not going to be, you know, if it's four or five days air temperature, it's only going to make a very, very small impact on the actual sea temperature. Plus the fact that the corals, more or less, they, they enjoy, temp what do you call it, living in depths up to, was it 70 feet or so? Yes, and actually that's an excellent point. So the so corals, the ones that I showed, were often in maybe one, two, three meters of water. So, and they're typically the very warm parts of the reef there, right up there with the sun. Corals, you're absolutely right, can live down to 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 meters depth. And the, actually the corals down there are also shown to be much more resistant to bleaching, partly because they don't get exposed to that very high temperature, and possibly partly because they're also in a quite different environment, because they've got much less light as well. So they don't have that extra stress of high light. Last thing, uh, sorry. You're saying there you weren't aware of energy uh, climate change. Were you aware that there was an ice age not recently? I am aware that there was an and ice age. And you realise there's no longer an ice age, so there must have been some temperature change or some climate change in that period of time. And in fact, climate is always changing. It absolutely is. And if you look is. back to the 10, 1000s, you're looking at the Roman era, the, uh, the was it middle, middle e mid medieval warm period? Medieval warm period, yes. Yeah, well, yep. that was quite warmer than what it is today. And also, if you go back to Roman times, it was much warmer again. Absolutely, we had the me medieval warm period, we had the little ice age, and that is part of climate. And that's from the um, average temperature graph that I showed, that is one of the things that I want to get across. Climate is a very long-term 
view of our environmental conditions. Things like weather, which is a very short-term um, short perception of what's actually happening right now, and so it's raining outside, that's what our weather is. Um, the, actually, the, perhaps a better way of thinking about it is that the weather is the trigger for the bleaching. So it's those really high temperature but short bursts of high temperature that trigger those mass bleaching events. Thank you very much for your questions. Um, somebody, could you take his name for the next event, maybe? Uh, <laughs> that would be great if we could hear a little bit more from you. Uh, could we have another question from the audience? These questions are great so far. Hands up if you would like to ask another question. Yes, please go ahead. I, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Um, not so much, I'm not sure if this is totally factually correct, but a lot of tourists are told to not wear sunscreen when they're uh, around coral areas. Absolutely. And I'm just wondering how exactly that affects corals and if you see more of this bleaching in these tourist areas as opposed to more, you know, kind of isolated coral regions. So the second part of your question is an excellent question. So does, do, is bleaching higher in areas that have a high tourist load, if you like. Uh, sadly, I do not know the answer to that question, but that is an excellent question. Um, but you're absolutely right. There are places around the world, such as Hawaii, that have actually banned normal sunscreen um, for people that are going into the water. Um, and that's because we now know that actually sunscreen is probably pretty toxic to corals. So it's kind of adding to all those stresses that corals already have, including people going on holiday, flipping their fi fins around, knocking over the coral, kicking up sediment, and then you're also washing off your sunscreen that then becomes toxic. Um, and what it is, it, well, the trigger and the reason that it's toxic is actually a really um, active part of coral reef research and it's probably partly chemical based and partly to do with how those sunscreens are made up. So they have, they work because they're full of titanium dioxide nanoparticles. So very, very small particles of titanium dioxide and it's probably those that are quite toxic to the corals. Thank you very much everybody for those fantastic questions. Uh, that's us all finished from Heidi. Could we please have another round of applause? Thank you, Heidi. Thank you.